Chapter 4 of The Journal of John Woolman by John Woolman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4, 1757-1758. Visit to the families of friends at Burlington, journey to Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia, and North Carolina, considerations on the state of friends there, and the exercise he was under in traveling among those so generally concerned in keeping slaves, with some observations on this subject, epistle to friends at New Garden and Crane Creek, thoughts on the neglect of a religious care in the education of the Negroes. 13th, 5th month, 1757. Being in good health, and abroad with friends visiting families, I lodged at a friend's house in Burlington. Going to bed about the time usual with me, I awoke in the night, and my meditations, as I lay, were on the goodness and mercy of the Lord, in a sense whereof my heart was contrited. After this I went to sleep again, in a short time I awoke, it was yet dark, and no appearance of day or moonshine, and as I opened mine eyes I saw a light in my chamber, at the apparent distance of five feet, about nine inches in diameter, of a clear, easy brightness, and near its center the most radiant. As I lay still looking upon it without any surprise, words were spoken to my inward ear, which filled my whole inward man. They were not the effect of thought, nor any conclusion in relation to the appearance, but as the language of the Holy One spoken in my mind. The words were, Certain evidence of divine truth. They were again repeated exactly in the same manner, and then the light disappeared. Feeling the exercise in relation to a visit to the southern provinces to increase upon me, I acquainted our monthly meeting therewith, and obtained their certificate. Expecting to go alone, one of my brothers who lived in Philadelphia, having some business in North Carolina, proposed going with me part of the way, but as he had a view of some outward affairs, to accept of him as a companion was some difficulty with me, whereupon I had conversation with him at sundry times. At length, feeling easy in my mind, I had conversation with several elderly friends of Philadelphia on the subject, and he, obtaining a certificate suitable to the occasion, we set off in the fifth month, 1757. Coming to Nottingham weekday meeting, we lodged at John Churchman's, where I met with our friend Benjamin Buffington, from New England, who was returning from a visit to the southern provinces. Thence we crossed the river Susquehanna, and lodged at William Cox's in Maryland. Soon after I entered this province, a deep and painful exercise came upon me, which I often had some feeling of, since my mind was drawn toward these parts, and with which I had acquainted my brother before we agreed to join as companions. As the people in this and the southern provinces live much on the labor of slaves, many of whom are used hardly, my concern was that I might attend with singleness of heart to the voice of the true shepherd, and be so supported as to remain unmoved at the faces of men. As it is common for friends on such a visit to have entertainment free of cost, a difficulty arose in my mind with respect to saving my money by kindness received from what appeared to me to be the gain of oppression. Receiving a gift, considered as a gift, brings the receiver under obligations to the benefactor, and has a natural tendency to draw the obliged into a party with the giver. To prevent difficulties of this kind, and to preserve the minds of judges from any bias, was that divine prohibition. Thou shalt not receive any gift, for a gift bindeth the wise, and perverteth the words of the righteous. Exodus 23, 8. As the disciples were sent forth without any provision for their journey, and our Lord said the workman is worthy of his meat, their labor in the gospel was considered as a reward for their entertainment, and therefore not received as a gift. Yet, in regard to my present journey, I could not see my way clear in that respect. The difference appeared thus. The entertainment the disciples met with was from them whose hearts God had opened to receive them, from a love to them and the truth they published, but we, considered as members of the same religious society, look upon it as a piece of civility to receive each other in such visits, and such receptions, at times, is partly in regard to reputation, and not from an inward unity of heart and spirit. Conduct is more convincing than language, and where people, by their actions, manifest that the slave trade is not so disagreeable to their principles, 
but that it may be encouraged, there is not a sound uniting with some friends who visit them. The prospect of so weighty a work, and of being so distinguished from many whom I esteemed before myself, brought me very low, and such were the conflicts of my soul that I had a near sympathy with the prophet, in the time of his weakness, when he said, If thou deal thus with me, kill me, I pray thee, if I have found favor in thy sight. Numbers 11.15 But I soon saw that this proceeded from the want of a full resignation to the divine will. Many were the afflictions which attended me, and in great abasement, with many tears, my cries were to the Almighty for his gracious and fatherly assistance, and after a time of deep trial I was favored to understand the state mentioned by the psalmist more clearly than ever I had done before, to wit, my soul is even as a weaned child. Psalm 131.2 Being thus helped to sink down into resignation, I felt a deliverance from that tempest in which I had been sorely exercised, and in calmness of mind went forward, trusting that the Lord Jesus Christ, as I faithfully attended to him, would be a counselor to me in all difficulties, and that by his strength I should be enabled even to leave money with the members of society where I had entertainment, when I found that omitting it would obstruct that work to which I believed he had called me. As I copy this after my return, I may here add that oftentimes I did so under a sense of duty. The way in which I did it was thus, when I expected soon to leave a friend's house where I had entertainment, if I believed that I should not keep clear from the gain of oppression without leaving money, I spoke to one of the heads of the family privately, and desired them to accept of those pieces of silver, and give them to such of their negroes as they believed would make the best use of them, and at other times I gave them to the negroes myself, as the way looked clearest to me. Before I came out, I had provided a large number of small pieces for this purpose, and thus offering them to some who appeared to be wealthy people was a trial both to me and them, but the fear of the Lord so covered me at times that my way was made easier than I expected, and few, if any, manifested any resentment at the offer, and most of them, after some conversation, accepted of them. Ninth of Fifth Month a friend at whose house we breakfasted, setting us a little on our way, I had conversation with him in the fear of the Lord concerning his slaves, in which my heart was tender. I used much plainness of speech with him, and he appeared to take it kindly. We pursued our journey without appointing meetings, being pressed in my mind to be at the yearly meeting in Virginia. In my traveling on the road, I often felt a cry rise from the center of my mind, Thus, O Lord, I am a stranger on the earth, hide not thy face from me. On the eleventh we crossed the rivers Potomac and Rappahannock, and lodged at Port Royal. On the way we had the company of a colonel of the militia, who appeared to be a thoughtful man. I took occasion to remark on the difference in general betwixt a people used to labor moderately for their living, training up their children in frugality and business, and those who live on the labor of slaves, the former, in my view, being the most happy life. He concurred in the remark, and mentioned the trouble arising from the untoward, slothful disposition of the negroes, adding that one of our laborers would do as much in a day as two of their slaves. I replied that free men, whose minds were properly on their business, found a satisfaction in improving, cultivating and providing for their families, but negroes, laboring to support others who claim them as their property, and expecting nothing but slavery during life, had not the like inducement to be industrious. After some further conversation I said that men having power too often misapplied it, that though we made slaves of the negroes, and the Turks made slaves of the Christians, I believe that liberty was the natural right of all men equally. This he did not deny, but said the lives of the negroes were so wretched in their own country that many of them live better here than there. I replied, there is great odds in regard to us on what principle we act, and so the conversation on that subject ended. I may here add that another person, some time afterwards, mentioned the wretchedness of the negroes, occasioned by their intestine wars, as an argument in favor of our fetching them away for slaves. 
To which I replied, If compassion for the Africans, on account of their domestic troubles, was the real motive of our purchasing them, that spirit of tenderness being attended to would incite us to use them kindly that, as strangers brought out of affliction, their lives might be happy among us. And as they are human creatures, whose souls are as precious as ours, and who may receive the same help and comfort from the Holy Scriptures as we do, we could not omit suitable endeavors to instruct them therein, but that while we manifest by our conduct that our views in purchasing them are to advance ourselves, and while our buying captives taken in war animates those parties to push on the war and increase desolation amongst them, to say they live unhappily in Africa is far from being an argument in our favor. I further said, the present circumstances of these provinces to me appear difficult. The slaves look like a burdensome stone to such as burden themselves with them, and that if the white people retain a resolution to prefer their outward prospects of gain to all other considerations, and do not act conscientiously toward them as fellow creatures, I believe that burden will grow heavier and heavier until times change in a way disagreeable to us. The person appeared very serious, and owned that in considering their condition and the manner of their treatment in these provinces, he had sometimes thought it might be just in the Almighty so to order it. Having traveled through Maryland, we came amongst friends at Cedar Creek in Virginia on the 12th, and the next day rode in company with several of them, a day's journey to Camp Creek. As I was riding along in the morning, my mind was deeply affected in the sense I had of the need of divine aid to support me in the various difficulties which attended me, and in uncommon distress of mind I cried in secret to the Most High, O Lord, be merciful, I beseech thee, to thy poor afflicted creature. After some time I felt inward relief, and, soon after, a friend and company began to talk in support of the slave trade, and said the Negroes were understood to be the offspring of Cain, their blackness being the mark which God set upon him after he murdered Abel, his brother, that it was the design of Providence they should be slaves, as a condition proper to the race of so wicked a man as Cain was. Then another spake in support of what had been said, to all which I replied in substance as follows, that Noah and his family were all who survived the flood, according to Scripture, and as Noah was of Seth's race, the family of Cain was wholly destroyed. One of them said that after the flood Ham went to the land of Nod and took a wife, that Nod was a land far distant, inhabited by Cain's race, and that the flood did not reach it, and as Ham was sentenced to be a servant of servants to his brethren, these two families, being thus joined, were undoubtedly fit only for slaves. I replied the flood was a judgment upon the world for their abominations, and it was granted that Cain's stock was the most wicked, and therefore unreasonable to suppose that they were spared. As to Ham's going to the land of Nod for a wife, no time being fixed, Nod might be inhabited by some of Noah's family before Ham married a second time. Moreover, the text saith that all flesh died that moved upon the earth. Genesis 7:21. I further reminded them how the prophets repeatedly declare that the son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father, but every one be answerable for his own sins. I was troubled to perceive the darkness of their imaginations and in some pressure of spirit said, The love of ease and gain are the motives in general of keeping slaves, and men are wont to take hold of weak arguments to support a cause which is unreasonable. I have no interest on either side, save only the interest which I desire to have in the truth. I believe liberty is their right, and as I see they are not only deprived of it, but treated in other respects with inhumanity in many places, I believe he who is a refuge for the oppressed will, in his own time, plead their cause, and happy will it be for such as walk in uprightness before him. And thus our conversation ended. Fourteenth of Fifth Month I was this day at Camp Creek Monthly Meeting, and then rode to the mountains up James River, and had a meeting at a friend's house, in both which I felt sorrow of heart, and my tears were poured out before the Lord, who was pleased to afford a degree of strength by which way was open to clear my mind amongst friends in those places. From thence I went to Fort Creek, 
and so to Cedar Creek again, at which place I now had a meeting. Here I found a tender seed, and as I was preserved in the ministry to keep low with the truth, the same truth in their hearts answered it, that it was a time of mutual refreshment from the presence of the Lord. I lodged at James Stanley's, father of William Stanley, one of the young men who suffered imprisonment at Winchester last summer on account of their testimony against fighting, and I had some satisfactory conversation with him concerning it. Hence I went to the Swamp Meeting and to Wyanoke Meeting, and then crossed James River and lodged near Burley. From the time of my entering Maryland, I had been much under sorrow, which of late so increased upon me that my mind was almost overwhelmed, and I may say with the psalmist, In my distress I called upon the Lord, and cried to my God, who in infinite goodness looked upon my affliction, and in my private retirement sent the Comforter for my relief, for which I humbly bless his holy name. The sense I had of the state of the churches brought a weight of distress upon me. The gold to me appeared dim, and the fine gold changed, and though this is the case too generally, yet the sense of it in these parts hath in a particular manner borne heavy upon me. It appeared to me that through the prevailing of the spirit of this world, the minds of many were brought to an inward desolation, and instead of the spirit of meekness, gentleness, and heavenly wisdom, which are the necessary companions of the true sheep of Christ, a spirit of fierceness and the love of dominion too generally prevailed. From small beginnings in air great buildings by degrees are raised, and from one age to another are more and more strengthened by the general concurrence of the people, and as men obtain reputation by their profession of the truth, their virtues are mentioned as arguments in favor of general error, and those of less note, to justify themselves, say, such and such good men did the like. By what other steps could the people of Judah arise to that height and wickedness as to give just ground for the prophet Isaiah to declare, in the name of the Lord, that none calleth for justice, nor any pleadeth for truth, Isaiah 59, 4, or for the Almighty to call upon the great city of Jerusalem just before the Babylonish captivity. If ye can find a man, if there be any who executeth judgment, that seeketh the truth, and I will pardon it, Jeremiah 5, 1. The prospect of a way being open to the same degeneracy in some parts of this newly settled land of America, in respect to our conduct towards the Negroes, hath deeply bowed my mind in this journey, and though briefly to relate how these people are treated is no agreeable work yet, after often reading over the notes I made as I traveled, I find my mind engaged to preserve them. Many of the white people in those provinces take little or no care of Negro marriages, and when Negroes marry after their own way, some make so little account of those marriages that with views of outward interest they often part men from their wives by selling them far asunder, which is common when the states are sold by executors at Vindu. Many whose labor is heavy being followed at their business in the field by a man with a whip, hired for that purpose, have in common little else allowed but one peck of Indian corn and some salt, for one week, with a few potatoes, the potatoes they commonly raise by their labor on the first day of the week. The correction ensuing on their disobedience to overseers, or slothfulness in business, is often very severe and sometimes desperate. Men and women have many times scarcely clothes sufficient to hide their nakedness, and boys and girls ten and twelve years old are often quite naked amongst their master's children. Some of our society, and some of the society called New Lights, use some endeavors to instruct those they have in reading, but in common this is not only neglected, but disapproved. These are the people by whose labor the other inhabitants are in a great measure supported, and many of them in the luxuries of life. These are the people who have made no agreement to serve us, and who have not forfeited their liberty that we know of. These are the souls for whom Christ died, and for our conduct towards them we must answer before him who is no respecter of persons. They who know the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom he hath sent, and are thus acquainted with the merciful, benevolent, gospel spirit, will therein perceive that the indignation of God is kindled against oppression and cruelty, 
and in beholding the great distress of so numerous a people will find cause for mourning. From my lodgings I went to Burley Meeting, where I felt my mind drawn in a quiet, resigned state. After a long silence I felt an engagement to stand up, and through the powerful operation of divine love we were favored with an edifying meeting. The next meeting we had was at Blackwater, and from thence went to the yearly meeting at the Western Branch. When business began, some queries were introduced by some of their members for consideration, and, if approved, they were to be answered hereafter by their respective monthly meetings. They were the Pennsylvania queries, which had been examined by a committee of Virginia yearly meeting appointed the last year, who made some alterations in them one of which alterations was made in favor of a custom which troubled me. The query was, are there any concern in the importation of Negroes, or in buying them after imported? Which was thus altered, are there any concern in the importation of Negroes, or buying them to trade in? As one query admitted with unanimity was, are there any concern in buying or vending goods unlawfully imported or prize goods, I found my mind engaged to say that as we professed the truth, and were there assembled to support the testimony of it, it was necessary for us to dwell deep and act in that wisdom which is pure, or otherwise we could not prosper. I then mentioned their alteration, and referring to the last mentioned query, added that as purchasing any merchandise taken by the sword was always allowed to be inconsistent with our principles, so Negroes being captives of war, or taken by stealth, it was inconsistent with our testimony to buy them, and their being our fellow creatures and sold as slaves added greatly to the iniquity. Friends appeared attentive to what was said, some expressed a care and concern about their negroes, none made any objection, by way of reply to what I said, but the query was admitted as they had altered it. As some of their members have heretofore traded in negroes, as in other merchandise, this query being admitted will be one step further than they have hitherto gone, and I did not see it at my duty to press for an alteration, but felt easy to leave it all to him who alone is able to turn the hearts of the mighty and make way for the spreading of truth on the earth by means agreeable to his infinite wisdom. In regard to those they already had, I felt my mind engaged to labor with them, and said that as we believe the scriptures were given forth by holy men, as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, and many of us know by experience that they are often helpful and comfortable, and believe ourselves bound in duty to teach our children to read them, I believe that if we were divested of all selfish views, the same good spirit that gave them forth would engage us to teach the Negroes to read, that they might have the benefit of them, some present manifested a concern to take more care in the education of their negroes. Twenty-ninth, fifth month. At the house where I lodged was a meeting of ministers and elders. I found an engagement to speak freely and plainly to them concerning their slaves, mentioning how they, as the first rank in the society, whose conduct in that case was much noticed by others, were under the stronger obligations to look carefully to themselves expressing how needful it was for them in that situation to be thoroughly divested of all selfish views that living in the pure truth and acting conscientiously towards those people in their education and otherwise they might be instrumental in helping forward a work so exceedingly necessary and so much neglected amongst them at the twelfth hour the meeting of worship began which was a solid meeting the next day about the tenth hour friends met to finish their business and then the meeting for worship ensued which to me was a laborious time but through the goodness of the lord truth i believed gained some ground and it was a strengthening opportunity to the honest hearted about this time i wrote an epistle to friends in the back settlements of north carolina as follows to friends at their monthly meeting at new garden and cane creek in north carolina dear friends it having pleased the Lord to draw me forth on a visit to some parts of Virginia and Carolina, you have often been in my mind, and though my way is not clear to come in person to visit you, yet I feel it in my heart to communicate a few things as they arise in the love of truth. First, my dear friends, dwell in humility, 
and take heed that no views of outward gain get too deep hold of you, that so your eyes being single to the Lord, you may be preserved in the way of safety. Where people let loose their minds after the love of outward things, and are more engaged in pursuing the prophets and seeking the friendships of this world than to be inwardly acquainted with the way of true peace, they walk in a vain shadow while the true comfort of life is wanting. Their examples are often hurtful to others, and their treasures thus collected do many times prove dangerous snares to their children. But where people are sincerely devoted to follow Christ, and dwell under the influence of His Holy Spirit, their stability and firmness, through a divine blessing, is at times like dew on the tender plants round about them, and the weightiness of their spirits secretly works on the minds of others. In this condition, through the spreading influence of divine love, they feel a care over the flock, and way is open for maintaining good order in the society. And though we may meet with opposition from another spirit, yet, as there is a dwelling in meekness, feeling our spirit subject, and moving only in the gentle, peaceable wisdom, the inward reward of quietness will be greater than all our difficulties. Where the pure life is kept to, and meetings of discipline are held in the authority of it, we find by experience that they are comfortable, and tend to the health of the body. While I write, the youth come fresh in my way. Dear young people, choose God for your portion, love his truth, and be not ashamed of it. Choose for your company such as serve him in uprightness, and shun as most dangerous the conversation of those whose lives are of an ill savor, for by frequenting such company some hopeful young people have come to great loss, and been drawn from less evils to greater, to their utter ruin. In the bloom of youth no ornament is so lovely as that of virtue, nor any enjoyments equal to those which we partake of in fully resigning ourselves to the divine will. These enjoyments add sweetness to all other comforts, and give true satisfaction in company and conversation, where people are mutually acquainted with it, and as your minds are thus seasoned with the truth, you will find strength to abide steadfast to the testimony of it, and be prepared for services in the church. And now, dear friends and brethren, as you are improving a wilderness, and may be numbered amongst the first planters in one part of a province, I beseech you, in the love of Jesus Christ, wisely to consider the force of your examples, and think how much your successors may be thereby affected. It is a help in a country, yea, and a great favor and blessing, when customs first settled are agreeable to sound wisdom. But when they are otherwise, the effect of them is grievous, and children feel themselves encompassed with difficulties prepared for them by their predecessors. As moderate care and exercise, under the discretion of true wisdom, are useful both to mind and body, so by these means in general the real wants of life are easily supplied, our gracious Father having so proportioned one to the other that keeping in the medium we may pass on quietly, where slaves are purchased to do our labor numerous difficulties attend it, to rational creatures bondage is uneasy, and frequently occasions sourness and discontent in them, which affects the family and such as claim the mastery over them. Thus people and their children are many times encompassed with vexations, which arise from their applying to wrong methods to get a living. I have been informed that there is a large number of friends in your parts who have no slaves, and in tender and most affectionate love I beseech you to keep clear from purchasing any. Look, my dear friends, to divine providence, and follow in simplicity that exercise of body, that plainness and frugality which true wisdom leads to, so may you be preserved from those dangers which attend such as are aiming at outward ease and greatness. Treasures, though small, attained on the true principle of virtue, are sweet, and while we walk in the light of the Lord there is true comfort and satisfaction in the possession, neither the murmurs of an oppressed people, nor a throbbing, uneasy conscience, nor anxious thoughts about the events of things, hinder the enjoyment of them. When we look towards the end of life, and think on the division of our substance among our successors, if we know that it was collected in the fear of the Lord, in honesty, in equity, and in uprightness of heart before Him, 
we may consider it as his gift to us, and with a single eye to his blessing, bestow it on those we leave behind us. Such is the happiness of the plain ways of true virtue. The work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. Isaiah thirty-two seventeen. Dwell here, my dear friends, and then in remote and solitary deserts you may find true peace and satisfaction. If the Lord be our God, in truth and reality, there is safety for us. For he is a stronghold in the day of trouble, and knoweth them that trust in him. Isle of White County, in Virginia, 20th of the 5th month, 1757. From the yearly meeting in Virginia, I went to Carolina, and on the 1st of 6th month was at Wells' monthly meeting, where the spring of the gospel ministry was opened, and the love of Jesus Christ experienced among us, to his name be the praise. Here my brother joined with some friends from New Garden who were going homeward, and I went next to Simon's Creek monthly meeting, where I was silent during the meeting for worship. When business came on, my mind was exercised concerning the poor slaves, but I did not feel my way clear to speak. In this condition I was bowed in spirit before the Lord, and with tears and inward supplication besought him so to open my understanding that I might know his will concerning me, and, at length, my mind was settled in silence. Near the end of their business, a member of their meeting expressed a concern that had some time lain upon him, on account of friends so much neglecting their duty in the education of their slaves, and proposed having meetings sometimes appointed for them on a weekday, to be attended only by some friends to be named in their monthly meetings. Many present appeared to unite with the proposal. One said he had often wondered that they, being our fellow creatures, and capable of religious understanding, had been so exceedingly neglected. Another expressed the like concern, and appeared zealous that in future it might be more closely considered. At length a minute was made, and the further consideration of it referred to their next monthly meeting. The friend who made this proposal hath negroes. He told me that he was at New Garden, about two hundred and fifty miles from home, and came back alone. That in this solitary journey this exercise, in regard to the education of their negroes, was from time to time renewed in his mind. A friend of some note in Virginia, who hath slaves, told me that he being far from home on a lonesome journey had many serious thoughts about them, and his mind was so impressed therewith that he believed he saw a time coming when divine providence would alter the circumstance of these people respecting their condition as slaves. From hence I went to a meeting at New Begun Creek, and sat a considerable time in much weakness, then I felt truth open the way to speak a little in much plainness and simplicity, till at length, through the increase of divine love amongst us, we had a seasoning opportunity. This was also the case at the head of Little River, where we had a crowded meeting on a first day. I went thence to the Old Neck, where I was led into a careful searching out of the secret workings of the mystery of iniquity, which, under a cover of religion, exalts itself against that pure spirit which leads in the way of meekness and self-denial. Piney Woods was the last meeting I was at in Carolina. It was large, and my heart being deeply engaged, I was drawn forth into a fervent labor amongst them. When I was at New Begun Creek, a friend was there who labored for his living, having no negroes, and who had been a minister many years. He came to me the next day, and as we rode together, he signified that he wanted to talk with me concerning a difficulty he had been under, which he related nearly as follows, that as monies had of late years been raised by a tax to carry on the wars, he had a scruple in his mind in regard to paying it, and chose rather to suffer restraint of his goods, but as he was the only person who refused it in those parts, and knew not that any one else was in the like circumstances, he signified that it had been a heavy trial to him, especially as some of his brethren had been uneasy with his conduct in that case. He added that from a sympathy he felt with me yesterday in meeting, he found freedom thus to open the matter in the way of querying concerning friends in our parts. 
I told him the state of friends amongst us as well as I was able, and also that I had for some time been under the like scruple. I believed him to be one who was concerned to walk uprightly before the Lord, and esteemed it my duty to preserve this note concerning him, Samuel Newby. From hence I went back into Virginia, and had a meeting near James Copeland's. It was a time of inward suffering, but through the goodness of the Lord I was made content. At another meeting, through the renewings of pure love, we had a very comfortable season. Traveling up and down of late, I have had renewed evidences that to be faithful to the Lord, and content with His will concerning me, is a most necessary and useful lesson for me to be learning. Looking less at the effects of my labor than at the pure motion and reality of the concern, as it arises from heavenly love. And the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength, and as the mind, by humble resignation, is united to him, and we utter words from an inward knowledge that they arise from the heavenly spring, though our way may be difficult, and it may require close attention to keep in it, and though the matter in which we may be led may tend to our own abasement, yet, if we continue in patience and meekness, heavenly peace will be the reward of our labors. I attended Curl's meeting, which, though small, was reviving to the honest-hearted. Afterwards I went to Black Creek and Caroline meetings, from whence, accompanied by William Stanley, before mentioned, I rode to Goose Creek, being much through the woods, and about one hundred miles. We lodged the first night at a public house, the second in the woods, and the next day we reached a friend's house at Goose Creek. In the woods we were under some disadvantage, having no fireworks nor bells for our horses, but we stopped a little before night and let them feed on the wild grass, which was plentiful, in the meantime cutting with our knives a store against night. We then secured our horses, and gathering some bushes under an oak we lay down, but the mosquitoes being numerous and the ground damp, I slept but little. Thus lying in the wilderness and looking at the stars, I was led to contemplate on the condition of our first parents when they were sent forth from the garden, how the Almighty, though they had been disobedient, continued to be a father to them, and showed them what tended to their felicity as intelligent creatures, and was acceptable to him. To provide things relative to our outward living, in the way of true wisdom, is good, and the gift of improving in things useful is a good gift, and comes from the Father of Lights. Many have had this gift, and from age to age there have been improvements of this kind made in the world, but some, not keeping to the pure gift, have in the creaturely cunning and self-exaltation sought out many inventions. As the first motive to these inventions of men, as distinct from that uprightness in which man was created, was evil, so the effects have been and are evil. It is, therefore, as necessary for us at this day constantly to attend on the heavenly gift, to be qualified to use rightly the good things in this life, amidst great improvements, as it was for our first parents when they were without any improvements, without any friend or father but God only. I was at a meeting at Goose Creek, and next at a monthly meeting at Fairfax, where, through the gracious dealing of the Almighty with us, his power prevailed over many hearts. From thence I went to Monocacy and Pipe Creek in Maryland. At both places I had caused humbly to adore him who had supported me through many exercises, and by whose help I was enabled to reach the true witness in the hearts of others. There were some hopeful young people in those parts. I had meetings afterwards at John Everett's in Monolin and at Huntington, and I was made humbly thankful to the Lord who opened my heart amongst the people in these new settlements, so that it was a time of encouragement to the honest-minded. At Monolin, a friend gave me some account of a religious society among the Dutch called Mennonists, and amongst other things related a passage in substance as follows. One of the Mennonists, having acquaintance with a man of another society at a considerable distance, and being with his wagon on business near the house of his said acquaintance, and night coming on, he had thoughts of putting up with him, but passing by his fields, and observing the distressed appearance of his slaves, he kindled a fire in the woods hard by, and lay there that night. 
his said acquaintance, hearing where he lodged, and afterward meeting the Mennonist, told him of it, adding he should have been heartily welcome at his house, and from there acquaintance in former time wondered at his conduct in that case. The Mennonist replied, Ever since I lodged by thy field I have wanted an opportunity to speak with thee. I had intended to come to thy house for entertainment, but seeing thy slaves at their work, and observing the manner of their dress, I had no liking to come to partake with thee. He then admonished him to use them with more humanity, and added, As I lay by the fire that night, I thought that, as I was a man of substance, thou wouldst have received me freely, but if I had been as poor as one of thy slaves, and had no power to help myself, I should have received from thy hand no kinder usage than they. In this journey I was out about two months, and travelled about eleven hundred and fifty miles. I returned home under an humbling sense of the gracious dealings of the Lord with me, and preserving me through many trials and afflictions. End of chapter 4 Recording by Devin Pertz, El Paso, Texas